Good evening and welcome to evening prayer. My left side is side one and my right is side two. God, come to my assistance. Lord, Lord make, make haste, haste to, help to help me. me. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. This day our risen Savior reigns, creation's undefeated King. While angels in resplendent light with mighty voice his triumph sing. This day the Lord has made his own, who broke from his confining grave. His living presence fills the world that by his cross he came to save. To God the Father glory give for Jesus Christ his deathless Son who with the Holy Spirit lives immortal and forever one. Amen. Please be seated. With his right hand, God has raised him up as king and savior. Alleluia. The Lord is my light and my help. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Before whom shall I shrink? When evildoers draw near to devour my flesh, it is they, my enemies and foes, who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart would not fear. Though war break out against me, even then would I trust. There is one thing I ask of the Lord, for this I long, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to savor the sweetness of the Lord, to behold his temple. For there he keeps me safe in his tent in the day of evil. He hides me in the shelter of his tent. On a rock he sets me safe. And now my head shall be raised above my foes who surround me, and I shall offer within his tent a sacrifice of joy. I will sing and make music for the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. With his right, right hand, hand, God has, has raised, raised him, him up, up as king, king and, savior. and savior. Alleluia. Alleluia. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Alleluia. O Lord, hear my voice when I call. Have mercy and answer. Of you my heart has spoken. Seek his face. It is your face, O Lord, that I seek. Hide not your face. Dismiss not your servant in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon or forsake me, O God, my help. Though father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Instruct me, Lord, in your way. On an even path, lead me. When they lie in ambush, protect me from my enemy's greed. False witnesses rise against me, breathing out fury. I am sure I shall see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Hope in him. Hold firm and take heart. Hope in the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I believe, believe that I, I shall, shall see the goodness, goodness of the Lord, Lord in the land of the living. Of the living. Alleluia. Alleluia.
from him, through him, and in him all things exist. Glory to him forever. Alleluia. Let us give thanks to the Father for having made you worthy to share the lot of the saints in light. He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Through him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creatures. In him everything in heaven and on earth was created, things visible and invisible. All were created through him, all were created for him. He is before all else that is. In him everything continues in being. It is he who is head of the body, the church. He who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that primacy may be his in everything. It pleased God to make absolute fullness reside in him, and by means of him to reconcile everything in his person, both on earth and in the heavens, making peace through the blood of his cross. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. From him, through him, him and, and in him, him all, all things, things exist. exist. Glory, Glory to, to him, him forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, because he remains forever, has a priesthood that does not pass away. Therefore, he is always able to save those who approach God through him, since he forever lives to make intercession for them. It was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, higher than the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he has no need to offer sacrifice day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He did that once for all when he offered himself. The disciples rejoiced, alleluia, alleluia. The disciples rejoiced, alleluia, alleluia. When they saw the risen Lord, alleluia, alleluia. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The disciples rejoiced, hallelujah, hallelujah. <coughs> if you live in me and my words live in you, all you ask for will be yours, hallelujah. My soul so proclaims the greatness, the greatness of the, of the Lord. Lord. My spirit, spirit rejoices, rejoices in God, God my, my Savior, Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. servant. From, From this day, day all generations will call me blessed. blessed. The, the Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. If you live in me, and my words live in you, all you ask for will be yours. Alleluia. Christ rose from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Let us pray to him, saying, Lord Jesus, Jesus, you live, live forever. forever. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, remember all who minister in your service. May their holy lives be an example to your people. Give to those who govern us the spirit of justice and peace, 
so that the human family may live in harmony. Guide our days in the way of salvation. And fill the earth with your plenty for the sake of the needy. Christ our Savior, light of the world, you have called creation from death to life. May your light shine forever on our departed brothers and sisters. Praying also earnestly for peace in this troubled world, we gather our prayers together and offer them in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O God, restorer and lover of innocence, direct the hearts of your servants toward yourself, that those you have set free from the darkness of unbelief may never stray from the light of your truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight, a uh, small but mighty group of prayers. Uh, tonight, as we continue to do throughout the year, we have Vespers on the third Wednesday of every month with the speakers. We don't take the summer off. Uh, during Lent, it was every Wednesday, but otherwise throughout the rest of the year, it's every third Wednesday. So tonight, I'm really pleased that we have with us Monsignor Gregory Mickish. Monsignor Mickish was born in St. Louis and grew up in Seven Holy Founders Parish in Afton, he entered the seminary out of grade school and was ordained in 1975. He has served as associate pastor in a number of parishes and then as pastor of Good Shepherd Parish in Ferguson and St. Alban Row Parish in Wildwood. In 2012, he became the vice rector of Kenrick Lennon Seminary and served there for seven years in that capacity. He is presently serving as senior associate at the St. Louis Cathedral Basilica with a special assignment of celebrating the Sacrament of Reconciliation and offering spiritual direction. He is also on the board of a small Catholic retreat center in Peebley, Vision of Peace, and afterwards I'm sure he'd love to tell you more about uh, our experiences working there and about the, the beauty of that location. So thank you, Monsignor, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Dan. Good to be with you this evening to be able to share some thoughts about the spiritual life. God asked me to give you a message, and the message is, welcome to the journey. It's called the spiritual journey, called the spiritual life. When did it begin? at your conception. 
because God called you, called me into existence. But every journey has a beginning and an end. So what's the end of the journey? Not in the sense of completion, but the goal, where are we headed? Union with God, full life in the Trinity. I'm one of seven siblings. <clears throat> My sister, who is the one just younger than myself, has six now adult children, all of whom are married. But I remember when we would gather for family celebrations and always pray before the meal. When her children were a year and a half, two years old, as we began the prayer with the sign of the cross, she would take the child's hand and help the child make the sign of the cross. And as simple as that gesture is, it was the beginning of awakening that child to the realization that there is a God and that the child is in relationship with God. It's the beginning of the journey, the journey into God's presence. The reflection that I want to share with you this evening is coming mainly from the works of St. Teresa of Jesus, also known as St. Teresa of Avila. St. John of the Cross, and St. Ignatius of Loyola. Two very brief stories about St. Teresa. These are authentic. They're not like the legendary one of Teresa being thrown out of the cart. I know we've all heard that one. But Teresa had a dear friend, John of the Cross, who was 26 years younger than her. Both Carmelites, both involved in the Reformed, Carmelites, going back to the original uh, charter for their communities. St. John of the Cross was only four feet, 10 inches tall. And when St. Saint, when Saint Teresa established one of her convents, one of her communities, she was able to have two Carmelite priests come as confessors and spiritual directors. And one of those priests was John of the Cross. And in a letter that she wrote to one of her sister friends, she says, we now have a friar and a half. <laughs> he was only four feet, 10 inches tall. She had a good sense of humor. Second brief story, John of the Cross was the confessor and spiritual director for a particular community of Carmelite sisters. And in a number of his conferences, he referred to Mother Superior, St. Teresa, as my daughter. Now he's 26 years younger than Teresa. But one of the sisters in that community took offense at that, that this young priest should be referring to Mother Teresa Superior as my daughter. And so she wrote a letter to St. Teresa complaining about John. St. Teresa wrote a letter back to this sister and said, Sister, I'm surprised that you are criticizing my father. So she was able to get the message across rather easily. I want to reflect on five particular principles in particular that are foundation, foundational for the spiritual life. And any author you might read or anyone who gives a presentation or reflection can choose many different ways to understand the spiritual life. But this is number one, identity. I'm meeting with about 25 people for a spiritual direction right now, some in a cathedral, some religious sisters, permanent deacons. They're probably getting tired of me asking them at the beginning of our time together, who are you? Where are you going? I keep repeating that because for me it's very important. The intonation is important. It's not an intonation of who are you, but rather 
Who are you? And I ask you to reflect on that in your own heart right now. How do you identify yourself? Well, I'm a wife, husband, mother, father. I'm a Catholic. We might think of our occupation. Those are all good, but go deeper. Who are you? In the deepest core of your being, who are you? One of the ways to respond to that is you are a beloved daughter of a loving father. You are a beloved son of a loving father who delights in gazing upon you. All the other identifications are good and important, but at the core of your soul, who are you? You're the beloved. Some dear friends of mine I've known for over 40 years, originally from New Orleans, and they came to St. Louis right about the time I was ordained. They were telling me the story one day that when they were in New Orleans, the husband and wife went over to the husband's parents' home for a Sunday dinner. And two months before that, they had had their first child. And so during the meal, the Sunday afternoon meal, they put the child down in the crib for a nap. And then after the meal, the grandfather of the child seemed to have disappeared, <laughs> just very briefly. So they went looking for him and they found him in the room where the child was in the crib. The grandfather had pulled a chair up to the crib and was just sitting there, not touching the child, not speaking, just gazing in the light at his first grandchild. And when they saw that, they said, how beautiful child couldn't do anything to earn the love and affection, but the grandfather was just gazing in delight. Can you see our father gazing at you with delight? Because you are his. He has claimed you. You belong to him. At Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, the voice came from the heavens, you are my beloved son. When we were baptized, God said the same thing to us. Couldn't hear it, but the words were there. You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. So who are you? What's your identity? At its deepest core, you're the beloved. And where are you going? Into the very life of the Trinity. And that's where you're going. Number two, second point, relationship. The spiritual life is essentially being in relationship with God. God causes the relationship. God initiates the relationship. And God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to awaken us to the fact that God is calling us to himself in our spiritual practices, in our times of prayer and meditation and reflection, we're not trying to wake God up. He has given us his Holy Spirit to awaken us to the realization that we are called to share divine life. I may have shared this with you last year when I spoke, it was just a year ago, 
one of the spiritual masters who has definitely had an impact on my own spiritual life is St. Augustine, lived around 400 AD. Voluminous writer, not easy to follow. St. Augustine's basic premise was, if you can say something in five words, say it in 50. He goes on and on and on. But among his writings is a book called De Trinitate, English translation on the Trinity. And I hope he doesn't get upset, but I'm going to sum up his 200 page book in one sentence. The Holy Spirit is the love that exists between the Father and the Son. It takes Augustine 200 pages to say that, <laughs> but that's what he's saying. With that realization that the Holy Spirit is the love that exists between the Father and the Son, and then we come to the farewell discourse in St. John's Gospel in which Jesus says, the Father and I give you our spirit. What is he giving or who is he giving? The Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. And Jesus says, the Father and I bestow our spirit upon you because we want you to share in the love of the Trinity itself. Relationship. God starts the relationship and God claims us as his own. Number three, unworthiness. As we grow in our spiritual life, if it does not happen, that we do not become aware of our unworthiness, something isn't working right. Because as we get closer to the light, the darkness within our own hearts will be revealed to us. If when we become aware of that darkness, it is an awareness that is condemning and critical, that's not coming from God. That's coming from the enemy, which is a term St. Ignatius uses for the devil. If the awareness of our unworthiness is a gentle call to purification, that's coming from God. Because in the spiritual life, we are going to reach that point when we are going to say to ourselves, Lord, I am not worthy. And that is a crisis moment in the original meaning of the word crisis. The word crisis means decision. We have to make a decision. And we either decide, who am I, such a hypocrite to think I could ever be holy, and we give up praying, or we say, God, you're the one who started this relationship. You know everything about me. And even my sin does not prevent you from wanting me. And so I trust you, God, that you will never reject me. You will never abandon me. I trust you. And then as we continue to progress, through the activity of the Holy Spirit within us, it's the Holy Spirit that causes our holiness, expect times of dryness in prayer when God will seem very distant. Now, intellectually, we know God never leaves us, but there will be times of dryness in prayer. And among the themes of the writings of St. John of the Cross, one of the most consistent themes that we read in his poetry and in his commentaries is expressed in the opening line of the poem called The Spiritual Canticle. And the opening line is very simple. 
Beloved, where have you hidden? John is longing for the experience of God's touch. But for some reason, it'll always happen in a spiritual life as we make progress that God will seem to withdraw for a time, never abandoning us, but that dryness expected to happen. You probably remember that when Mother Teresa of Calcutta passed away and her personal diary <coughs> was made known, she said for years, her prayer seemed so dry. And it was interesting to see the response of the secular press. It was basically, oh, you people thought she was so holy, and now that her diary is revealed, you'd see she didn't know much about God. Well, anyone who knows about anything about the spiritual life was not surprised by that dryness. Expect it to happen. And when we come out of that dryness and look back on it, then we can see how God was carrying us all during that time, never abandon us. A fourth point, littleness, littleness. I can't remember where I read the article, but within the last six months, I came, an artic came across an article on anthropology, the study of the evolution, the development of human beings. Uh, Homo sapiens been around 200,000 years, perhaps. Neanderthal man, we've all heard about them. They were around 400,000 years and then disappeared no longer existing. So Homo sapiens about 400, about 200,000 years. But the article was saying, and how the author ever calculated this, I don't know. He said there have probably been about 125 billion Homo sapiens who have lived on the face of the earth so far. So we are one of those 125 billion. My littleness. Could God really be interested in me? Yes. Jesus thinks I'm worth dying for. We're all familiar with the prayer of the Angelus, with the three invocations. The third invocation is, and the word was made flesh. I'm going to ask you to take 30 seconds of silence. And I invite you to repeat those words, but add two words at the end. The word was made flesh for me. The word was made flesh for me. Pray that, a few seconds of silence, and pay attention to your heart. What feelings, what awareness comes into your own heart? The word was made flesh for me. Yes, for all of humanity, but for you as the individual you are. That's how much God is in love with you and desires that you and I share his life. The next time you go to Mass, 
I invite you to pay very close attention to the words of consecration and really allow those words to seep into the depths of your heart. This is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Yes, it's true. It's true. Am I little in the number of human beings who have lived? Yes. Am I little in God's eyes? No. He thinks I'm worth dying for. That's pretty profound. Number five, the last point, destiny. <clears throat> We're going somewhere. If all there is to life is what we experience here on this earth, it's good, earthly life is good. But every human being is longing for something more. Always more. You heard about the man who won $5 million in the lottery? He was ecstatic for about 30 seconds. And then he said, what if it had been 10? We're always looking for more. That's intentional because of the presence of the Holy Spirit within our hearts who is moving us, motivating us, causing that longing and yearning within our hearts for fullness of love and life. And as St. Augustine says, only God can fulfill that. We're thankful to God for the blessings he gives us in this earthly journey, family and friends, the ability to know and to love. But always more, we're looking for more. Our destiny, God made us for himself. I want to conclude with two brief Ignatian meditations. St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuit community, lived in the 1500s. Some of you have heard me say we have 37 doctors of the church. The Holy Father just made another doctor within the last few months. We now have 37. There should be 38. <laughs> Ignatius of Loyola, why he is not considered a doctor of the church, I do not know. A doctor of the church, man or woman, canonized saint who has written something that has had a tremendous impact on the spiritual lives of people. Ignatius of Loyola, his spiritual discernment, discernment of spirits, touching millions of lives. Someday he'll make it. I know he's completely happy in heaven, but he deserves the honor. But let's take two brief Ignatian meditations. St. Ignatius encourages us when we're praying with scripture to use our imagination, give freedom to our imagination, and insert us in the text, insert ourselves in the text. So again, if you, I never tell people what to do, I always invite. If you wanna close your eyes, during these two meditations, feel free to do so. I know you will not have fallen asleep. The first one, the Sermon on the Mount. You are a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus is sitting on a rock, looking down at a gathering of people, let's say 150, 200 people. They're sitting on the ground listening to Jesus. And you hear him say, blessed, are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful. But you're sitting off to the side, not with a large group, but sitting off to the side listening to Jesus. And as you're watching him and listening to him, something happens. The thought comes into your mind, he's 
God. He's God. And with that, Jesus stops speaking for a moment, turns toward you, makes eye contact with you, has a slight smile on his face, and nods his head because he knows what you're thinking. And with that gesture and eye contact, he's saying to you, you're right. Now you understand. Jesus is God. A second meditation. You have completed your earthly journey, which is a polite way of saying you just died. And you realize you're on a path, but you're not walking on that path alone. Jesus is on your left side and the Holy Spirit is on your right side. And you've never been here before. This is new territory, but you're on a path and you're walking along slowly and Jesus has his hand on your shoulder because he knows you're anxious. And as you walk along, you say, but I'm a sinner. And the Holy Spirit says, yes, a forgiven sinner. And you walk along a little farther. And you say, but I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, I make you worthy by my sacrifice of the cross. And so you continue the journey and up ahead is a turn in the path. And as you enter that turn, what do you see but the Father running towards you, arms open up in the air, smile on his face saying, you're home, you're home. And this is what I desire for you your home and he embraces you holds you to himself imagination yes but it sounds very familiar very similar to Jesus promise So you are on a journey, it's called a spiritual life. You started when you were conceived, a unique person who never existed before. This journey has a goal, life in the Trinity, where we will see Jesus. We will see the wounds caused by his crucifixion, but wounds of love willingness to suffer for us. Identity, who are you? You are the beloved. Relationship, God started it. He wants us. Unworthy, yes, but Jesus makes us worthy. Littleness, yes but worth dying for. The destiny, life in the Trinity. Seeing Jesus, seeing the Father, seeing the Son. St. Augustine's famous words, our hearts will never rest, O Lord, until they rest in you. And we close with a prayer. We praise you, Lord God, most blessed Trinity, 
We praise you, Father, you who are the source of all life, the source of all that is good. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice of the cross and the power and glory of your resurrection. We praise you, Holy Spirit, indwelling divine presence, gift of the Father and the Son. Guide us on this journey with wisdom and courage, with trust in the Father's promise that he made us for himself. And Lord Jesus, draw us into your sacred heart and bring us into the presence of the Father. And with our blessed mother, all the angels and saints, we may offer praise now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor. That was a perfect signpost for our journey. I appreciate that. And I'd say out of uh, just 12, 15 of us or so here, we're the only ones out of 125 billion people who read St. Augustine in one sentence. So <laughs> another great benefit to being here. So thank you again for coming tonight. Please tell your uh, friends and neighbors and family, they could all be the same, that could be one person, to, uh, to come back uh, next week. We're going to have, or next month, we'll have Father Michael Rainier, who's a very unique a priest in the Archdiocese. He's, he's the pastor of Holy Epiphany Parish in South City, I think. Uh, Father Rainier is a convert from the Ang Anglican faith. He converted to Catholicism in 2011. He's an Anglican priest. He was ordained in 2016. Father Rainier is married with five children. So he's a priest in our Archdiocese with a very unique background. The topic is going to be on C.S. Lewis, who was uh, a tremendous spiritual writer, as is Father Rainier. If you've seen any of his writings in uh, St. Louis Review and other Catholic publications, he's a tremendous writer. And uh, appropriate for him to speak about C.S. Lewis, a great spiritual writer who is this close to becoming Catholic. Somebody had said, well, if he had lived just a little longer, he probably would have become Catholic. But he's, he's as, ca as Catholic as you can be without being Catholic. So please come back and uh, bring more people.